Good morning, I'm Rose Cushing, host of Carolina Hoofbeats TV, and today I have Lawson Walston, who is the manager at the NC State Equine Education Unit, and Kaylee Renner, who is an up-and-coming trainer and president of the FFA. And we want to talk to you about ponying your colt. So Lawson, tell us a little bit about why this is a good service. First of all, uh, teaching your horse how to pony is a good service because it's teaching safety. Our goal is to do everything as safely as possible. I found out over the years of training that if you actually always take, go ahead and pony an animal, it makes them a little more confident. Okay? There's also another reason that I really like ponying is because it builds confidence between the rider and the horse. Um, the thing I would like to mention a little bit about is preparation. Preparation is you have to prepare your pony horse, and the pony horse is the one that's actually leading the horse. Um, you never just start out there going out there and doing it. Uh, you want to get them well prepared. Uh, first of all, what we always do is actually have them in a round pen, somewhere that we know good footing. Uh, we take the horse and we put them in situations. And like Kaylee and I were talking about earlier today, one of the first situations we do is teach the horse to start pushing things. Uh, and, what, and what we do is teach the horse to step into a barrel to push it over. And you'd be amazed how many people can't take their animal, excuse me for doing this mm -hmm. to you, right. but you step into them. Right. Um, there's a natural fear of just stepping into something. Um, so preparing the pony horse for this, then you can use balls and whatever. Um, the other thing is the horse need, needs to know how to neck rein a little bit, uh, yield off the legs, turn, off the foot, turn on the forehand, turn on the haunches. haunches. Uh, you gotta get the control of the animal, okay? And the next step that we always do is actually take the rope. And you won't believe how many animals you can take a rope and put it around the horn and just jiggle up and down and run into them, how many will not stand for that? You've got to do that first. You've got to do that preparation. Then we, once they actually will stand and let you do, flow the rope around them and everything else as well, and without the rider getting hurt, then you start to teach them to pull. You've got to put a little bit around the horn and let them, when they feel that pressure, to learn how to step in when mm -hmm. we ask them to. When we don't ask them to, to pull against that pressure. All this preparation prepares us for when we actually get to pony that horse. American lifestyle. It's how we work. It's how we play. It's how we learn and how we enjoy the finer things in life. How we take care of our animals and tend to the land. It's a way of life. It has been for hundreds of years. Now there's a whole new way for rural America to watch TV. This ponying situation is not easy. We've actually been blessed with uh, Kaylee here. I'm gonna let her talk a little bit in just a second. And the preparation of her horse, uh, it takes a lot of time. We worked a whole year on her horse, getting it prepared so it can actually pony horses. Everybody goes, why long a, a year? Consistency. You want the animal to be consistent and become a great team. And you've got, they have to learn to stay together. When things happen out, like the horse is rearing up, you want to be able to trust your animal, take one step forward if it needs to, take one step back, or to push into you. Mm -hmm. And to be able to take that, he has to learn to stay, do exactly what you say. Everybody likes to lead horses to touch noses. When you're ponying, he's not allowed to do that. The pony horse focuses on one job, straight ahead. He can't throw his hip at you. Even though the other horse is trying to bite you. Mm -hmm. And this is where the pony rider has a, a hard job. Kayla, would you like to say something about the pony rider on this aspect, on so, the preparation? So being a pony rider, Lawson and uh, many others have taught me that you have to have a soft eye. You have to watch not only your horse that you're ponying and uh, the one that you're riding, but also around you. Um, in your environment, if I can see something and spot something ahead that might possibly be an issue, I have the opportunity to set myself up to expect yeah, anything. Said. So it's it's an observing game. It honestly is, and it's very um, it's a very thrilling part of uh, training horses. Being able to link up and you know move smoothly, it's almost like a dance between both animals. 
sounds like it's almost like a check a chess game because you have to anticipate what the ponied horse is going to do so you can outsmart it and be ahead of it a little bit right that is exactly right very it's, nice it's a game of outsmarting both animals at times right so for our viewers that may not understand what we're talking about in pony and explain exactly what we're we're talking about ponying is when you take a horse and the horse is being ridden by a rider and you take another horse on your right side and lead it in the directions. Um, it's, I made it in a simple version by saying this, but it's actually really got a lot of difficulty in it. You need to prepare your animal to, and you need to know what to do. For example, if that horse goes to pull him back on you, you need to know that you can turn your horse into it and get that pressure off and engage. And Kaylee made a good comment earlier talking about linking up. When a horse goes to pull it on you, you turn them in a tight circle until they actually get side by side and that tells you they've linked up, then you can lead it on. Uh, a lot of people call it in the round pin hooking up. So it's a different version of it, but we call it linking up when we go to ponying. It it's, takes time and pressure. You don't just go out there to your trail, take your horse on a trail ride and, uh, and pony another horse. You gotta practice it first. It takes a lot of time, a lot of practice. So you don't just hook up to him and drag him through the woods? You? No, I found that to be very dangerous. <laughs> I, I will it. say that I have found my pony horses that went on to be very well. I give a great example. My wife, I started an Arabian that I could use to pony draft horses off of just about. Wow. And he was that big and strong, but he trusted me. Um, my wife had, was riding him on the trail to, in Biltmore, and the little girl got ran away with and wouldn't stop. So she actually turned the horse into the middle of the trail and took a hit and that little horse held that little that, that big horse in, in position and kept her from getting run away when this girl was yelling and then she pointed him back to the farm awesome but it, it's a good tool and anytime you got a tool that you can utilize with your horses you made a better job for you and an easier job for you um, it's a good aspect to learn with your horses we also use it for breaking horses and starting on those horses. Kaylee can talk to us a little bit about how we started her horse on the saddle. Yeah, tell me what you did. So I've got a little three-year-old black Tennessee walking filly now. Um, we got her, oh man, from an auction down in Troutman. And when she came to us, it took, it took us about two weeks to finally lay a hand on her. And when we did lay a hand on her, it was, you know, very subtle and that was it. She was gone. But now we've got her to the point where I can pony her and we can sack her out. We do this thing called sacking out with feed bags or with a raincoat and throw it, you know, all over the saddle. Um, we like for both horses to link up to the point where I can walk and gate beside her without her trying to get ahead of me or behind me. <clears throat> and my horse is at the point right now, if she, and especially with her in season right now, she likes to act up a little bit. So she falls back because she's looking at the colt in the other field. You know, it's our job to cut, you know, quickly. Because mm -hmm. if not, we're going to either lose her, I might fall off. You know, there's just too many things that could possibly go on. So it's quick thinking off your feet. And uh, actually, with Lawson's help the other day, I was able to put my fifth or sixth ride on her due to him ponying right beside me. And that is a feeling like no other. <laughs> that just, that, that one ride has made my entire summer. Awesome. Well, our family business create family adventures here at K&M Trailer Sales. Mike Smith with K&M Trailer Sales, conveniently located right off Highway 152 in Rockwell, North Carolina. Come see me, I'm sure I got a trailer for you. The horse learned how to, we taught her how to hook up before we started saddling her and riding her, working on riding her. She knew when so we, uh, beside this other horse that she's safe. Our whole goal is to keep safety as possible. I personally myself have had a lot of young horses. You know, the strongest fear of a horse is fear and flight. And if they're out on the trail or actually on the racetrack or even been in the round pen, 
something spooks them, the first thing you want to do is either jump out of the round pen or take you away or take you through something. And I had one one night jump in the middle of a pond with me because uh, he got so scared. Uh, but if I had another horse beside of him that was more seasoned, more trusting, uh, my whole goal was to do this pony situation was to decrease my chances of myself or Kaylee or the horses or something has happened. Again, it's a tool that we utilize to make our job easier. That's the whole goal between ponying. But I will say, you've got to start in a round pen. The horse does need to know how to lead first before the one that you pony in. And the horse being, uh, the pony horse has to have a lot of control and it must be pretty much unflappable. It takes a lot of practice. And practice becomes makes you safer. Uh, I'm 54 years old right now and I can honestly tell you, I don't try not to make the same mistakes as I did when she was at her age because I really hate for them to follow me. Absolutely. And you were saying that it's an important to have a team to do this, so tell us a little bit about that. The team is that when we do things together, we always do as a team uh, because, again, it's for safety. Uh, Kaylee and I communicate. Uh, when we did the Portofino uh, Angel Johnson County Fund uh, Derby, uh, we're always talking to each other talking about what the horse is doing, what the other horse is doing, how we can help you out. Kaylee, you actually gave me a story earlier about when you were pony and that gray mare, I believe it was. What happened that, that you said the communication, how did that affect you? So uh, I was ponying this beautiful thoroughbred gray mare uh, named Galloway Glitter. And it was our first time that I've been next to her and she's substantially a whole lot bigger than my horse so mm -hmm. I'm taking the little man and just saying hey I know you know she's a giant and everything's against you right now but you got it just you know you can do it <laughs> go get it <laughs> and um, I building off confidence this was in our early probably I'd say one year yeah of we ponying. just finished our first year um, I had gotten in the round pen with her and I teed up and all that is is uh, lining up and Lawson or a handler will bring me a horse to my side It'll always be my right side. And immediately after, it circles, you know, constant circles. I'm trying to link up with this mare. I'm trying to, you know, be as safe as possible because if I don't link up, things could go bad for me, things could go bad for her, and I could lose complete trust in my horse. You know, he may never trust me again. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> everything was going fine for a while. We had linked up and we we're starting to expand our circle out a little bit more. And it was a frisky cold morning, I believe it was in October or December, and she started rearing up with me. First horse to ever do this with me. Now, the gray mare or your horse? The gray, the gray mare. mare. Okay. Gotcha. Her horse is a, her nurse knows what to do. Okay. Yeah. So this gray mare was rearing up with me, and I, you know, never, I, I've heard of it happening before, but I never saw it coming from her, and I froze. And that is such a dangerous situation. And immediately Lawson said, Kaylee, you know, hey, snap out of it. Come on, circle, circle, circles. Immediately, it's just scary hearing that. It's a situation, and yet we work as a team together. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So it worked out, you know, after communicating back and forth, somebody had to get me out of that zone. I was terrified. I was a deer in headlights because I've got this humongous gray mare roaring at my horse and I. Trying you know, to eat her. <laughs> yeah. She's striking and all of this and that. And at the time i didn't think i could do it but i was in the middle of the situation like you and i were talking about earlier i had to get it done and with people like lawson and other people uh they're waiting to lend you a hand it makes the situation a whole lot better he watches me as well as the horses if he sees i'm getting tense he starts talking to me a little bit more and through talking you breathe you know you settle in a mm -hmm. little bit Very nicely said so it's a team it definitely is it's constant communication i know we probably sounded crazy going down the track in clayton because it was <laughs> <laughs> hey you know i was ponying a quarter horse who was terribly strong and i asked lawson and some of the other girls if they wouldn't mind falling back and they fell back and made almost a wall so this horse wasn't going to get away from me and maybe it even intimidated him to fall back a little bit more so it's it's definitely a callback game right back and forth with with each other awesome the thing i like to mention about that situation is kaylee's horse used to be a very fearful horse in come situations like this ponying has made this horse so much braver that horse that she was talking about was very difficult um he if it had went wrong she could not trust her horse 
And the only reason she can trust her horse because the practice and the amount of work we put in. You've got to put a lot of work in. We practice everything in the round pen before we ever went to Portofino. We practice everywhere else. And so when we actually got into a situation, the horse knew what to do. And Kaylee knew what to do, even though both of them were probably just a little bit nervous. Sure. And I'll be honest with you, I was nervous that day well, yeah, too. Yeah, I mean, there's that five, ten second delay, yeah, like, yeah. oh God. <laughs> you don't have five, ten seconds. You, yeah. got, you just yeah. got to react. Right, right. Hi, I'm Jesse Chase of Jesse Chase Performance Horses in Wendell, North Carolina, and I'm proud to feed Mule City Feeds. Mule City was first recommended to me by a vet who felt that I would benefit from a custom mitt. Overall, I've been thrilled with the customer service at Mule City Feed, the quality of products that they use, and how my horses have looked and performed since making that change. So stop by today and check out Paul Dunn at Mule City Feed. So tell me a little bit about the equipment that you use. All right, well, uh, one of our main things is we have to wear a helmet. Not only, I mean, I would love for everybody to wear a helmet. There's, even if you have the brokest horse around, there's a chance for them to stumble. There's a chance for you to fall off. And uh, I love my Troxel helmet. It's, it's protect my melon for several years now. <laughs> Actually, I just got a new one for my birthday. But we use helmets as well as vests, because if you can imagine a horse rearing up like Galloway Glitter, they have the opportunity to strike you in your back mm -hmm. or bite you in your back. So a little bit of padding, I mean, it's not going to save you from scars or bruises, but it is going to help you a little bit. This is a standard vest. This isn't like one of the vests that the jumpers and inventors use. Um, there's no tank to make this blow up. It's just uh, padded. It's foam padded. But it still provides a lot of protection. You'll find on the racetrack now that all of them use them for anybody working on the racetrack has to have has vets now. Behind the starting gates and they have to wear helmets. Mm -hmm. These are the standard type vests and a bull rider's vest is very, very similar to okay. this. Okay, mm -hmm. very smart. Now, uh, besides the vest and the helmet, I also like to wear chaps. Not for looks, actually, but Even those are very pretty chaps. <laughs> they are very pretty. <laughs> due to, uh, we can get some frisky horses now and then, and they love to try to gnaw on your legs. If they're not trying to gnaw on your legs, they're trying to gnaw on the saddle or the horse that uh, you're riding. So it's very important to keep a soft eye because you're your horse's protector. Mm -hmm. If I see the horse that I'm ponying, you know, attempting or making faces at my horse, I have to brace them out. You know, that is, that's a no-no. He can't make faces at my horse, just like my horse can't make faces at him. Right. They have to get along beside each other. But um, The now, biggest thing is that she takes control. She's the number one leader in this situation. She has to make, see that very quickly and react. She can't just wait to let something happen. Um, and this is the beginning of the training we talked about. The horse must be able to sit there and take just about anything. Right. We're not gonna abuse them, but we're going to teach them to slowly, patiently take all the stimulus that could possibly affect them. Sure, the unexpected. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Because it's definitely an adrenaline rush. When something happens, you know, it definitely goes, uh, goes down quickly. And I also like to mention in our training, it wasn't just different scenarios and basic stuff. Lawson also brought in desensitizing um, training techniques. I think the most um, mm -hmm. <laughs> eventful one was the one before your Lumberton clinic because Lawson was like, oh, you're going to do great. You know, we're going to go out and blow the crowd away. And he had the truck out there with the radio going and the lights flashing. And uh, it was just, it was very exciting. He had, um, oh man, a mic and was saying things. And I still had to, you know, go past all these distractions without having my horse scare off or skittish or fall back because forward is the main thing he cannot stop if i tell him to go he's got to keep moving them feet because if he doesn't the horse that i'm ponying you know might get tangled up might cause issues and uh it's just that's the main key with ponying is forward movement it's not stopping your horse will always stop <laughs> you've got to keep going though 
And if you guys happened to miss them in Lumberton last year or in Raleigh recently, they did blow the crowd away. And we're begging them to come to Lumberton in August. Thank you for letting us give us that chance because we really enjoyed it. Yeah, you guys are awesome. And, you know, this is a training technique that you don't see very often anymore. And I think it's a very good one that we should resurrect and take out of the I box. Agree. You know, learn how to do it, learn how to do it right. But it's really safe and effective once you do. Biggest thing is practice, practice, practice at home before you ever take it anywhere else. And then you, once you're comfortable at home, then start taking it somewhere. And every bit of the training that you put on your ponying horse pays off for you in the long run because it's just making them a better horse every day. So that's really awesome. Anything else that you want to add that we might have forgotten? No, I'd like to thank uh, the people at the Johnson County uh, Angel Fund for letting us pony some horses for them. I'd also like to thank Curtis Dean and uh, Cool Breeze Stables for letting us work with them on those situations. And uh, thank everybody else for coming to look at us at uh, Lumberton and in Raleigh. And it's something that we enjoy. And I'm going to go ahead and say it right there. This is why I, I still train for the youth. We need to take the time to show the students how to do things and how to do it safely and uh, let them learn from our mistakes. Absolutely. All right, so now that our horse is nice and clean, um, we're going to talk about clipping. So the first thing is to make sure that you have a super safe environment to do your clipping in. And if you're going to use an extension cord like this one, make sure you use something heavy, okay? You don't want a little indoor extension cord because if something does happen, and we hope it won't, that your horse steps on the cord, you don't want him to cut through the plastic and electrocute himself if he has on shoes and all that. So um, I would recommend a safe spot and make sure that you've got a cord handy. Now, again, like we talked about in the beginning, ongoing maintenance and training are super important here. So if you cl your horse is super hairy and you cl clip him at the last minute before the show, it's gonna look like you did, right? So you just wanna kinda keep him clipped along. And then the other thing that you wanna think about with the clipping is that your horse is comfortable doing it. Again, I really like to use food reward-based training to make sure that they're comfortable with it, but you need to practice this with your clippers off, with your clippers on, dragging the um, extension cord around and all these things. So when show day comes, everybody's not really stressed out trying to get this done and your horse is happy for you to clip him. So that's what you want to start with, okay? Couple products you want to think about, blade wash. You also want to think about the size of your clippers, and you should definitely get them out a week or so ahead of time. Make sure the blades are sharp and that they're actually working, okay? So different sizes of clippers, I would recommend somewhere in the 10 to 30 range, okay? So 10 um, cuts not as close as 30. 10 you might use in the winter or when they've got kind of like this, an interim spring coat. And then the 30s you're gonna use in summer to get really, really close, okay? So, um, not necessarily specific to dressage, but a lot of people kind of miss this, is they don't get on the jaw. And it's really important to get what I call the grandfather hairs that can hang down from the jaw, super important. Now, in our discipline, it's a little bit different than some disciplines. In some disciplines, it's gotta be, I mean, I literally have worked in barns where they've singed horses with candles to make sure that they were that clean. Dressage people, um, tend, I guess because dressage is based, you know, originally kind of came from Europe, we tend to think more about the horse and his natural state and his comfort, right? So we will often leave his whiskers. Now, why would you do that, you ask? My husband, he's a quarter horse person or an Appaloosa person, he thinks it's absolutely the worst thing in the world. But the sensors that the horse has to keep him from bumping into things, those are in his whiskers. And the research shows there's tons of information that they gather from having those whiskers. So. Even at my highest level that I've shown, I've always left the whiskers, well not always, but in my later years when I'm a little wiser hopefully, I've left the, list, the whiskers natural. Now some people, especially at the super high levels of dressage, they want to clip them all the way to the skin. That's certainly a matter of preference. And then other people will clip them not all the way to the skin, but not so they're really long and wavy, just for a little bit better look. Again, it's a matter of preference. I do not clip eye whiskers because they can keep the horse from injuring himself. My thought is the whiskers keep him from snagging an eye or snagging a nostril or bumping into something or cutting themselves or their lips. But again, that's up to you. 
Um, you just also want to keep in mind when you're clipping the level of show that you're going to. Because if you're going to a schooling show, you don't need to take off as much hair as you do if you're going to an upper level show or you're going to ride the Grand Prix. So also in that consideration is not just the horse show, but also your horse's living environment. If your horse lives outside, then you need to leave a little bit more hair on the legs and things like that for protection. If your horse lives inside, not a big deal. So let's talk about ears, okay? So when you go to clip ears, um, if your horse lives outside, he needs his ear hair, okay? So if this horse was gonna be clipped today, I would hold his ears together like this, and I would take all this hair off right here so it looks nice and flat, and then I would do the edges of his ears, okay? That is because he lives outside. Now, I think it looks neat enough, and unless I was going to ride some really important show and do the Grand Prix or go to the Olympics, I would leave as much ear hair in there as I can. If you choose to do the ear hair though, you need to be really consistent in the length and you need to be good at it and your horse needs to be quiet. Otherwise, you're gonna get started and it can be a mess, right? So again, this is where the training, the reward-based training, positive reinforcement, the horse's emotional state is important because you need to be able to finish what you start. If you need the ears to be clean, then you're actually gonna clip all inside of the ear here. And I do recommend that you put some cotton or they make some special little yarn balls in their ears to keep the hair from falling down in there. That way you're not clipping and the horse shakes and you take out a big chunk of something, hopefully not mane, that you didn't mean to. So it's really important that you think about your clipping ahead of time, horse's environment, where you're going, and exactly what it needs to look like, okay? So that kind of um, covers most of the things we want to talk about clipping. We'll talk about, um, we'll actually show you in a bit how to do fetlock um, clipping and we'll talk about, we'll show you stockings and socks and that sort of thing. Now I personally, I do not clip stockings and socks. First of all, the easy wash, right? It takes all the dirt out, so it's not as important. The other thing, similarly to what we were talking about earlier with wet skin, is when you take that horse's hair off, if he's got white socks and you clip it to the skin with a really short blade, then he is now exposed to flies and microabrasions. So you're gonna have more skin problems on those horses if you're gonna clip the stockings and socks like almost to the skin to make them white. That's definitely not something that I do and not something that I recommend, but again, it is a matter of preference. So we've talked about whiskers, fetlocks, right? So if you got a horse that's got a lot of hair, it protects him, don't worry about it for a school and show if you're doing the dressage, they don't mind, right? All you're trying to do in the end is make a positive overall impression that is appropriate for the level that you are showing and make sure that you're keeping your horse's comfort in mind. Mm -hmm.